Uh, my subject is, why are the Jews so smart? <clears throat> but before giving you a, 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 some answers to this question, there are a few pre preliminary questions which I need to discuss. Uh, namely, are the Jews smart? Uh, are all the Jews smart, or only some of them? And can we quantify the smartness of the Jews by intelligence questions? So I will de deal with these questions first. In the uh, historical times, up to the 19th century, no one in Europe had much interest in whether the Jews were smart or not. The Jews lived in self-contained communities, generally ghettos in regions of uh, cities where they were confined and they were not allowed to enter the professions or to uh, or the skilled trades. They were largely confined to dealing in second-hand goods and in money lending. And uh, they spoke Yiddish, so Gentiles were not readily able to communicate with them. They had not produced any people of distinction with the exception of Spinoza. So there was no reason to suppose that the Jews were smart. This changed in the early years of the 19th century after the Jews were emancipated over most of Europe by Napoleon in 1812, uh, they were permitted to enter uh, Gentile society and uh, enter various occupations, uh, in, in which they did. And uh, generally, initially, they entered banking. Uh, it is, uh, in the early years of the 19th century, it began to become evident to people that the Jews are indeed smart. Here in England, David Ricardo published his book uh, on the principles of political economy and taxation, which was well received. And uh, more spectacularly, uh, Nathan Rothschild, uh, who established uh, the Rothschild Bank in London, made a spectacular financial killing in, 1950, in 1815 at the time of the Battle of Waterloo. <coughs> People in the uh, financial world in London were well aware that if we lost, we the British lost the battle, the value of shares would go down. But if we won the battle, the value of shares would go up. So the outcome of the battle was eagerly awaited. Nathan Rothschild got there first by the use of a carrier pigeon who conveyed the news of our victory at Waterloo to him and he promptly sold all his shares. The news spread rapidly through the city of London. Everyone said, good gracious, Rothschild knows that we've lost sell. And so large numbers of people sold, the shares plummeted, and when Rothschild judged they'd bottomed out, he bought a great number of them and made a very substantial amount of money. It was a very shrewd and uh, smart operation, although perhaps slightly dishonest. <coughs> During the rest of the century, Jews became increasingly prominent in Britain. Uh, remarkably, a Jew, Benjamin Disraeli, became Prime Minister in 1874, a very remarkable achievement for a Jew in a country where there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism, as there was throughout Europe. <coughs> and it was not only in Britain that Jews became successful. They were successful in many countries in Europe. Rothschild's banks were established in the major financial centers in Paris, Naples, Vienna, 
and Frankfurt. And other Jewish banks, notably the Kleinwarts, were established in Berlin. And it was not only in banking that smart Jews began to appear. In music, they included uh, Meyerbeer, Mendelssohn, Mahler, uh, and in political economy, Karl Marx. <clears throat> By the middle decades of the century, people began to note the intelligence of the Jews in written publications. It was noted in Britain by Francis Galton, the cousin of Charles Darwin, in his book, Hereditary Genius of 1869, um, in which he estimated IQs of various peoples uh, and noted that the Jews and the Chinese have a high intelligence. Uh, it was noted by the Count de Gobineau in France, who maintained that the Jews and the Aryans were the two most intelligent peoples, a view which was uh, uh, <coughs> taken on board by Hitler and set out in his Mein Kampf. And it was noted in, in the United States by Mark Twain. And it, it, this, this became widely accepted uh, throughout Europe and the United States. <coughs> With the invention of the intelligence test in 1905 by Alfred Binet in Paris and the refinement of the test and the method of scoring it by Wilhelm Stern in 1912 uh, who constructed the metric of the IQ which I have summarized for you here this was the uh, method of measuring intelligence by Wilhelm Stern, uh, Jewish of course, as you will see from his name. He was the professor of psychology at the University of Breslau, then in East Germany, now Rockau, if you'll forgive my pronunciation, in Poland, following the transfer of a slice of East Germany to Poland in 1945. Stern set the population IQ mean at 100 with a range of 96% of the population between, the ra between 70 and 130. Uh, below 70 are the uh, mentally uh, people variously described over the century as mentally retarded, imbeciles, uh, the feeble-minded, but now generally known as uh, slow learners. <coughs> and uh, that is comprised 2% of the population. And at the other end of the continuum, there is another 2% with IQs above 130. These are the intellectual elite, consisting of people like ourselves. <coughs> <clears throat> now, once the IQ test had been invented, uh, it was used, uh, administered, and its uh, explanatory powers were explored uh, for many phenomena, and it became, uh, it has become evident over, the, say, over a century of research that the IQ measured uh, in children at the age of perhaps seven or eight has a reasonably significant predictive power for subsequent outcomes, including the individual's educational achievement, their earnings, their socioeconomic status, uh, their intellectual output, <coughs> and their longevity, since your IQ is a determinant of how long you live. For fairly obvious reasons, people with high intelligence look after their health more sensibly, uh, go to the physician if they uh, have worrying symptoms, uh, eat sensibly and abstain from taking drugs and things of that kind. <coughs> My uh, uh, contribution to uh, research on intelligence has been to collect the IQs 
of uh, nations and races. It was said by the British physicist <coughs> Rutherford, who was the first to split the, at the atom, for which he was given the Nobel Prize. It was said by him that all, <coughs> uh, all serious science is physics. The rest is just stamp collecting. And this is pretty well true of my own work in this field. Uh, my particular variant of stamp collecting has been to collect IQs of peoples from all over the world. And I have in my collection about 600 of these, which I have been able to classify according to the nations from which they come and the races to which they belong. And among, uh, in my collection, I have a number of studies of the IQs of the Jews. So we are now able to look at this uh, question of what the IQ of the Jews is. Can anyone help me bring up the next slide? What is the intelligence of the Jews? Now, in considering the intelligence of peoples all over the world, I set the uh, standard against which these are measured at 100 in Britain, analogous to the initial work of Wilhelm Stern uh, in Germany. Uh, with a standard deviation of 15 in the same range between 70 and 130. And in relation to the British IQ of uh, 100, uh, we have these four different categories of Jews. Uh, the Ashkenazim, these are the European Jews, of course, uh, formerly largely resident in Russia until the 1880s, when they were uh, attacked and most of them fled to the United States, uh, where there are about six million of them today, and they are, by virtue of their high IQ of 110, an immensely powerful subgroup in the United States, as is probably very well known, uh, control American foreign policy, and have a very powerful influence in, uh, throughout uh, all, virtually all professions and occupations in the United States. The next group are the Sephardim. These are the Jews who were for, resident for many years in Spain and Portugal, uh, from which they were expelled in 1492. The Spanish uh, said, you must either convert to Christianity or get out. And most of them decided to get out, but some converted, known as conversos, and others pretended to convert, but retained their Jewish faith and practices in secret, or so they hoped, but were sometimes identified and then burnt, pour encourage les autres. Then come the, uh, we don't know too much about the Sephardim after being expelled from Spain and Portugal a few years later. They dispersed to various places in the world. A number went to the Netherlands. Um, a few went to the Middle East uh, in the contemporary, around contemporary Lebanon. But most of them went to the Balkans and most of them were, were lost in the Holocaust. <coughs> but there are some escape to Israel. Then there are the Mizrahim, these are the North African and Asian Jews, largely resident for many centuries in Iraq, some in Iran, uh, a number in Morocco, and nearly all of these moved to Israel after the foundation of the state in 1948. And finally, there are the Ethiopian Jews, or sometimes called the black Jews, a population of Jews who 
uh, in Ethiopia who adopted Judaism many centuries ago and after the foundation of the State of Israel uh, asked to be admitted to the state. And there was some discussion about whether these were, could be regarded as bona fide Jews, because they are not, of course, genetically related to the other Jews, which are all re genetically related to each other, coming from the same original population in Palestine. Uh, but uh, it was decided that they could be accepted, and uh, they, are, they are all resident in Israel. And they have their, their IQ of 69, which is about the same as that of other sub-Saharan African peoples. <coughs> now, to put these IQs in the global context, I show you here the IQs of the principal racial groups. And you'll see that the Ashkenazim are the most intelligent people in the world with their IQ of 110. Then come the Northeast Asians from China and Japan and Korea, with their IQ of 105. The Europeans from North and Central Europe, going down to North Italy, with their IQ of 100. <coughs> the IQ drops as you go to the far south of Europe, in, the, in Greece, in Andalusia, and in the toe of Italy, and Sicily to around 92. Then we have the Miz Mizrahim, which I show you in the first slide with their IQ of 91. Blacks in the United States have an IQ of 85. North Africans of 84. South Asians from uh, the Middle East through to Vietnam with an IQ of also of 84. Blacks in the Caribbean with an IQ of 72. Blacks in Africa with an IQ of 70, just about the same as the IQ of the Ethiopian Jews in Israel. And towards the bottom, the Australian Aborigines with their IQ of 62. And finally, the group with the lowest IQ of all peoples, the Pygmies of the Congo rainforest with their IQs of 53. <coughs> now, a curious feature of the IQ of the Jews is that they are particularly strong on the verbal and reasoning abilities and not nearly so strong on the visual and spatial abilities. These are the abilities that are required, say, to look at the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and see quickly how the bits fit into the total picture. And these, there's this profile of the Jews <coughs> expresses itself in the areas of attainment in which Jews excel. Jews are very prominent in occupations requiring verbal and reasoning abilities, such as law, science, um, literature, um, <coughs> academic work generally. Um, but not so strong on the visual and occupations requiring visual and spatial abilities such as uh, engineering and architecture. There are not many prominent Jews in the fields of engineering and architecture because they don't have the talent to excel in those professions. And one is hard put to name eminent Jews in these occupations, although it is easy to name many eminent Jews in uh, other, or other occupations. <coughs> Now, the, Jew, the high intelligence of the Jews was rapidly expressed itself in the United States from which, to which most of the Jews went after they fled from Russia uh, from the, in, the, in the 1880s. Uh, they arrived as penniless refugees, mainly in New York, and uh, initially had to take humble occupations, mainly in tailoring, but their children inherited their high IQs and excelled at school and began to gain entry to the elite universities. And by around 1920, this became a, a matter of concern to those who ran these universities, uh, which were largely run by WASPs, 
white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in those days because they, it appeared that they were being swamped by these large number of Jews obtaining entrance. Jews were reaching about 20% of the intake in Harvard, Yale and Princeton and as high as 40% in Columbia in New York City. And uh, they decided, it was decided, steps had to be taken to try and contain the number of Jews, otherwise the place would be totally swamped by these clever Jews. Previously, Jews had been admitted on a, the SAT, the Scholastic Ability Test, as it was called in those days, a test of, uh, in mathematics and English, English, more or less an intelligence test, which is why the Jews did so well. Uh, but in order to contain the intake of Jews, other criteria for admission became adopted. Uh, regional quotas were established so that uh, it was easier to get into Harvard and Yale if you came from remote states uh, because of you. there weren't many. There were, uh, uh, there were very few Jews, so that kept the number of, in these states, although there was a quota for them. Um, so that kept the number of Jews down. Uh, by these means, the, the use of uh, character qualities for as part of the assessment criteria were uh, adopted <coughs> in order to uh, contain the number of Jews and uh, through these means the numbers of Jews, the percentage of Jews has been stabilized at around 20 percent in these elite universities. <coughs> now I will pass quickly to the theories of the high Ashkenazi intelligence. First of all, there is the eugenics theory. This theory is that the Jews have practiced eugenic policies. Policies, that is, the, the, the word was coined by Francis Galton, whose book I mentioned earlier, uh, to designate programs, conscious or unconscious, which had the effect of raising the intelligence of the population. The theory is that Jews practice eugenic policies um, of this kind. Jewish rabbis had high IQs because you had to do a, a great deal of learning to become one and succeed in the learning. And these had uh, occupied a highly prestigious position in Jewish societies. And it was the ambition of uh, rich fathers to marry, get their marry, daughters to marry rabbis. Uh, so this, uh, which, which they often succeeded. So this brought together brains and wealth. Now in historic times, up to about 1900, the rich had more surviving children than the poor. They were able to feed them better, would be the main reason. So they were able to fight disease more effectively. Um, <coughs> this came to an end about the year 1900. But uh, the result of this was that rabbis and their rich wives between them had more surviving children than the rest. And over the course of many centuries, even a small tendency of this kind will be sufficient to raise the IQ of the population, probably in itself sufficient to raise it to an IQ of 110 over the course of a couple of thousand years. The second theory is the persecution theory. According to this theory, Jews have, were persecuted for many centuries and in many places in Europe and often killed. And the more intelligent Jews anticipated these uh, pogroms, as they were called in Russia, and moved on in time, while the less intelligent Jews were caught in them and killed. Thirdly, there's the discrimination theory. This is the theory that Jews were not allowed to enter many professions, or hardly any professions, but they were allowed to enter the profession of money lending. This was prohibited to Christians um, as a, it was regarded as usury and uh, thought to be against Christian teaching. It, this betrayed a poor understanding of economics, of course, because money, the ability to borrow money 
is an important part of any functioning economy and people aren't going to lend money unless they're going to get some rate of interest. But Jews were able to occupy this niche of money lending and to do this well in order to make sure that you had uh, proper security uh, to, to assess whether you were likely to be repaid uh, and what the chances were for closing on the debtor, these required a high verbal IQ and those who had this prospered in this profession and had a relatively large number of surviving children. Then there is the apostasy theory advanced by Charles Murray. Uh, this theory is, uh, he begins with the fact, apparently correct more or less, that in the first century AD there were about four and a half million Jews but in the Roman Empire but by the 6th century, this was down to one and a half. It declined, the numbers had declined very considerably. Now, Murray suggests that this was because all Jewish boys were required to learn the Jewish holy books, the Torah and the Talmud. And this was such an onerous task that many of the less intelligent ones just gave up and left the religion, leaving the intelligent ones behind. So he puts the IQ, high IQ of the, uh, of the Jews right back to the, uh, uh, the period uh, just during and just after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. And finally there is a new gene theory proposed by Cochrane, Hardy and Harpenting a few years ago. This theory is that a new gene for high intelligence appeared in, by a mu as a mutation, strictly speaking an allele, an allele being a variant of an existing gene, but for shorthand a new gene appeared about the year 1200 in the Ashkenazi and spread throughout the Ashkenazim population. This new gene had the effects, according to this theory, not only of raising the IQ, but also of producing Gaucher's disease. Uh, and have this dual effect. Um, so the theory is that uh, uh, it relies on the fact that Goucher disease is associated with high intelligence. Uh, it's a rather speculative theory and um, it really awaits the discovery of this gene. If this gene is actually discovered, it would be a very major advance. Now this was advanced some uh, eight years ago and this gene has yet to be discovered. So I would put that as a rather speculative theory. Uh, let us place it on the black back burner until someone may or may not discover this gene. The apostasy theory of Charles Murray, I'm a bit skeptical about this. Uh, it, I, it is, I think, accepted that the population of Jews did decline considerably over these five centuries, the first five centuries of our era, but whether this was because uh, the more, the less intelligent ones left uh, and it left the more intelligent ones remind, I think, left behind is very much open to speculation. I regard the other three theories as all quite plausible and it's quite likely that they have all played some part in raising the IQ of the Ashkenazim to its high level. Thank you.